We spoke about one turning point, which is 1961, the trial of Adolf Eichmann. The second point, when Mr. Levi Eshkol is our Prime Minister, takes place on May and June 1967, the Six Day War. How is it connected to our topic? The State of Israel experiences a tough period at the time, not knowing will there be, will there not be a war. We call the months of May 1967 the months of waiting or hesitations. The government hesitated, shall we be the first to launch a war or not? The youth is preparing, digging some underground shelters. The tanks are preparing and then the war starts. But more important and more relevant to our topic is the month of May. And during this month of May, soldiers who already are recruited describe in their diaries or letters, at that time there was no computer, people wrote letters still, they describe scenes from the Holocaust. We have published their letters. Siach Lochamim, it's called in Hebrew. Conversations with soldiers or with warriors. And it's amazing how they compare the Warsaw Ghetto and the current situation of Israel in 1967 using comparisons because the fear about the war was so serious. And what caused another fear was the radio speech of the Prime Minister, Mr. Eshkol, in Hebrew, Hanuma Megumgam. He spoke live in the radio and because of some changes in the text, there were no computers. Uh, I remember it personally. So we got this feeling that the land of Israel, the state of Israel, stands before destruction, before destruction. Thanks God this did not happen. There was a big victory. And, but the May, the month of May, will never be forgotten as the month of fear and this comparison with the events of the Holocaust just 20 years earlier. By the way, our ex-foreign minister of foreign affairs, Abba Ibn, the man who spoke perfectly 18 languages, um, he used at that time an expression which I would like to share with you. When referring to the borders of the State of Israel of, of 1967, before the war, he said, we have to defend the borders of Auschwitz, referring to the very narrow yeah. Israel, something that politicians should never forget. And he wasn't a Likud, he was the Labour Party. The borders of Auschwitz. How can we defend such a place in which a tank needs five minutes to cross from the sea to Kfar Saba? So we have already two stations. Number three is the Yom Kippur War, October 1973, which surprised the State of Israel and the Israeli army completely. You may remember those who were born at the time. And you may remember also the horrible situation of our army and our country. Thanks God it lasted, it lasted only three days. But after the first day, our Minister of Defense, the hero of the Sixth Day War, Moshe Dayan, uh, in a press conference used a sentence which all of us remember until now and which uh, was relevant to that day, only that day, thanks God, after three days, God helped us. And he used the expression, We stand very close to the destruction of the Third Temple meaning two temples are gone, you know, Jewish history, and the third temple, the State of Israel, is in danger of existence. And he was, it was not far from reality. It didn't happen, Baruch Hashem, uh, but the three days were as well compared with scenes of the Holocaust, the final solution, destruction, death, captivity of the Jewish people. So we have 61, 67, 73. Here are some maps and pictures of the Yom Kippur War, the third traumatic event uh, in the awareness of the Holocaust in Israeli society. In the meantime, the relations between Holocaust survivors and German youth 
became very intimate when Aktion Zunitsch and Friedensdienste sent volunteers to treat Holocaust survivors. The young people from Germany were very surprised that the survivors of the Holocaust are not only ready to meet them, but those who are German to speak with them in the, in the language of the murderers. They really were surprised, at, at the beginning at least. So this meeting between young Germans and Holocaust survivors, which continues until today, was a very important step. Here, uh, ISF with Holocaust survivors uh, in the 80s, I think. And then many associations were founded in Germany in the 60s and 70s. And the highlight of the, Israel, of the relations between Israel and uh, Bundesrepublik Deutschland was with the visit of the first chancellor, uh, Willy Brandt, 1973. Our prime minister at that time is still Golda Meir, who is the legendary Minister of Foreign Affairs, Abba Ibn. And you may know or forgot that uh, Mr. Brandt almost died in Israel when his uh, helicopter, Hubschrauber, almost fell from Masada. It was a miracle. We didn't need such an event. Here she is. They say that she dedicated one month to buy this dress. <laughs> she was not known for her fashionable way. <laughs> you see, helicopter buffeted, Brandt pushed out in the last minute. A miracle, a real miracle. Can you imagine German Chancellor dying in the Jewish state? <laughs> so the relations, the friendly relations between the country of the survivors and the country of the final solution continued with new politicians, Rabin, Brandt, Dayan, Helmut Schmidt, who, by the way, was one-eighth Jewish, as he wrote in his autobiography shortly before he died last year. Mr. Shamir, Mr. Cole, here in Yad Vashem. And we celebrated 50 years of relations in 2005. One is still alive, the other is not with us anymore. Questions, remarks? I need some rest. Did Konrad Adenauer um, express um, um, repentance in time? Absolutely. It's a question I'm asked very often. Germany stands very clear behind its crimes from 33 to 45. It doesn't deny them. It is ready to pay, partially at least, for them. Of course, in Germany, there, are, there is one party and then there are individuals who deny the Holocaust. But Germany as a state accepts its crimes and it is said in every speech of, of Angela Merkel, very clear, in a very clear language, not the slightest hesitation, yes. And not only this, in German schools and universities, it is the most educated country in the world about the Holocaust. I think German pupils learn the Holocaust more than Israelis. Israelis. I know it from my personal experience. So yes, absolutely, the answer is absolutely yes, with no hesitation. Of course, more than Poland. What about France? Oh, this is problematic. <laughs> France doesn't want to do it until now, until now. Until, and the French collaborated enthusiastically, enthusiastically. What about Italy? Italy and Spain are two examples of bosom friends of Nazi Germany, We're very close friends. But concerning Jews, their attitude was totally different. Italians protected Jews in many areas. It's not total, but in uh, southern France and in uh, Greece, until they were kicked out by the Germans, they protected Jews. The Italians did not send one Jew from Thessaloniki to Auschwitz. If they would be there, we, the Holocaust would be different. And the Spanish, you know, French Jews crossed the border illegally. Not one Jew was sent back like the Swiss did, for instance. So it's interesting. Very close relations, the same ideology, but concerning Jews it was different, basically. Of course, they are not, not saints, the Italians, 
but not villains like the Germans. So you said that there are many organizations in Germany um, which you described, and also I know that there are uh, various big speaking a lot about the Holocaust schools. Um, I heard a lot of them, but um, how would you describe the situation that many people are still against the state of Israel and in Germany and people start to deny the Holocaust and they don't care, they start to be really passive about that. So how can this happen if they talk so much about it? I think that the criticism of, uh, against Israel comes, I think so, Uh, primarily out of the fact that uh, maybe they don't realize or don't know or don't understand it. But I know many Germans, many of them sit here in this hall who love Israel. Thanks God. So, uh, uh, what about Austria? Well, Austria does not imitate the attitude of Germany. Um, I think that its attitude is different, reluctant to accept the past. It's not easy, I know, but you have to, to, to know your own past for a better future. Austria is different. We don't have enough time to elaborate on it, but it's clear, it's different, much more different. I'm Swiss, and what about uh, reconciliation in Switzerland? Well, in general, the Swiss people behaved horribly towards Jews. I have to tell the truth. We should never bury something under the carpet. With exceptions, if I take, the, if I take Hungary, 44, saving over 100,000 Jews from Budapest, a Swiss person called Karl Lutz, Charles Lutz was partner of Raoul Wallenberg. So there were good Swiss people, and I forgot the name of the border policeman who saved Jews. So there were individuals who did a lot Uh, Lutz was a, uh, was a uh, diplomat, but speaking generally, you know what they did, horrible. I recently also saw a film which shocked me, I didn't know about it, uh, a very rich Jewish um, animal uh, dealer who was murdered in Switzerland by anti-Semitic Swiss people because of money. I didn't know about it. There is a film now, shocking, horrible. I don't remember. Do you know the film? It's a, it's a new film, a real, a real case. A Jew murdered in Switzerland because he was Jewish to get hold of his money. And uh, for many years, Switzerland tried to, to hide this, this event. Yeah. No, no. Well, I can tell you, my mother is a Holocaust survivor, and I know how much she gets per month. It's really a shame. She can't even buy medications for it. And I'll continue personally. My mother is now 92 years old, and she applied for a little more because, you know, health deteriorates. It was seven months ago. We saw no change. Now they want to send physicians to test her. 92 years old lady after operation and they have to, to do it quickly. They you get sometimes the feeling that they wait that you die, so they don't have to pay anymore. That's sometimes the feeling. So the answer is no. Yes. Uh, then, uh, on the political point of view, what was the alternate, alternate solution or uh, what was the another solution which was proposed? To be honest, there wasn't. There was no alternative, just to negotiate with the country of the murderers. And I think this was exactly the pragmatic decision of the then Israeli government. I think only people like Ben Gurion and Charette were able, because they were, they were not born in Israel, <coughs> but they lived here for so many years, <coughs> and they were free of the sentimental connection with Europe. If there would be different people, I think such an agreement would, would never have been born. It was a purely pragmatic, cold, emotionless decision. This was the only option. There was no other. Just to stand in the street and beg for some sense.
The agreement had two parts. First of all, the state of Israel as the successor of the Holocaust victims and survivors got certain sum of money. This payment uh, was completed in 1965 because everything which was promised was paid. The second part of the agreement assured personal individual payments for Holocaust survivors. It was a very complicated story, still not ended because there were groups of Jews who never got anything. For instance, Jews from Greece, only in the last years, don't ask me why. Jews from Africa who also were victims, I think some of them still do not get anything. Libya, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Iraq. And so some groups were excluded, there was a lot of bureaucracy, but those who got the money, and I mentioned it's not a big sum, it really saved them, it really saved their lives, otherwise they would collapse. So it was important, and this individual payment continues as long as the person who is a Holocaust survivor lives. When he goes away, when he passes away, it stops immediately. His children or relatives do not get it anymore. And as I say, there is some feeling, I cannot prove it, that the authorities of Germany just wait to pay less. What about the East Germany? East Germany never, in comparison to what I answered to you, East Germany never accepted the bad, we are the good ones, the bad ones are there behind the border. Of course, this is ridiculous. And there were, mm, there was one or two trials against uh, some perpetrators, uh, totally uh, distorted attitude, totally distorted. No questions, no remarks. So we analyzed the years from 48, even earlier to today. I men uh, forgot to mention one thing. The fifth dramatic event, which also brought back reminiscences from the Holocaust was November 1995. You remember what happened at that Saturday night, the assassination of Prime Minister Rabin, which was a very traumatic event in the life of Israel, also brought back some dark remembering, uh, remembrance. So we have a lot of turning points in the awareness of the Israeli society and the Holocaust survivors to the Holocaust events. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to me. All the best. Israel 성교 전문 방송 브레드 TV. 이스라엘을 위해 기도하고 싶으신데 기도 제목을 잘 모르시겠다고요? 그럴 땐 이스라엘 전문 방송 브레드 TV로 들어오시면 됩니다. 언제 어디서나 시청 가능한 브레드 TV. 매번 주석 검색하시느라 힘드셨죠? 브레드 TV 바로 가기 아이콘을 만들면 한 번에 들어가 원하시는 방송을 시청하실 수 있습니다. 브레드 TV 바로 가기 아이콘 만들기. 삼성, LG 등 안드로이드 버전입니다. 먼저 인터넷 버튼을 눌러 주세요. 그리고 브레드 TV.co.kr을 입력. 브레드 TV 홈페이지로 이동합니다. 홈페이지로 이동한 후 핸드폰 하단의 메뉴 버튼을 눌러 주세요. 여기서 홈 화면에 바로 가기 추가. 이 버튼만 누르면 끝이에요. 이제 바탕화면에 생긴 브레드 TV 아이콘을 누르시면 한 번에 원하시는 방송을 선택 신청하실 수 있습니다. 다음은 아이폰에서 바로 가기 아이콘 만드는 방법입니다. 인터넷 버튼을 누르세요. 그리고 브레드 TV.co.kr을 입력. 브레드 TV 홈페이지로 이동합니다. 이동 후 화면을 움직이면 핸드폰 하단에 메뉴바가 나옵니다. 여기서 가운데 버튼을 클릭하고 바로 보이는 홈 화면에 추가를 눌러주세요. 그리고 추가 버튼만 누르면 끝입니다. 마지막으로 아이패드에서 바로 가기 아이콘을 만드는 방법입니다. 역시 인터넷 버튼을 눌러주세요. 그리고 breadtv.co.kr을 입력, 홈페이지로 이동하면 주소창 옆에 화살표를 클릭, 홈 화면에 추가 버튼을 누르고 추가를 누르면 끝이에요. 이제 바탕화면에 생긴 브레드 TV 아이콘을 누르시면 한 번에 원하시는 방송을 선택 신청하실 수 있습니다. 